We have also confirmed uh, 679 cases, 639 of which are in New York City. Um, and due to our continuous pressure, uh, we know that we need to secure more doses of the vaccine. So we have over 60,000 to date. That includes New York State and New York City. And I want to thank President Biden and his administration for being responsive. Um, we also have a recent round from the feds being distributed as we speak. And we're also reallocating over 2,000 doses from other parts of the state uh, at this time. So just to give a snapshot of where we are and some thoughts on uh, how to contain monkeypox, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bassett first. So Dr. Bassett. Thank you very much, Governor. And let me just say, uh, I, I would like to thank the governor for all of her partnerships on health-related issues, on COVID, on reproductive rights, and so many uh, contemporary public health issues. I'm going to talk about uh, monkeypox because it's a growing concern for all of us. It's just been about two and a half months uh, since the current outbreak began, and it's already extended to over 60 countries around the world. And since mid-May, it has arrived in the United States and been diagnosed in individuals across the country in virtually every sta state. Uh, but our state, New York State, has the highest numbers by far in the nation. And it is these numbers that drive our sense of urgency. Your health department and its incredible professional staff have been working tirelessly. There are three aspects of the current outbreak that make it unusual and concerning. The first, we are seeing monkeypox ongoing transmission in countries where it has not previously been seen. Second, the clinical presentation is not classical. It's not what you'll see if you Google monkeypox. And overwhelmingly, the people who've been diagnosed are people who identify as gay, bisexual, or men who have sex with men. Anyone can get monkeypox, but right now, this virus is spreading through the social networks of men who have sex with men. So as ever, the department is providing information to the public reaching out to advocates and activists in the LGBTQ community, uh, with which we have long-standing and highly valued collaborative relationships. Healthcare providers are receiving information from us so that they're aware of and can diagnose and test for suspected cases. We've been developing clinical guidance, expanding test capacity, initially from our public health labs, now to commercial labs, partnering with the federal government, as the governor has said, and revitalizing our network of, uh, of local health departments, which remains such a key part of our public health infrastructure in, this, in the state as the entity that will be distributing vaccines and, of course, educating the public. We're doing all of this uh, with real attention to the importance of dignity and respect without stigma and with equity always at the center of our work. So uh, you can see the case update on the slide um, uh, already. The CDC has reported something over 2,100 cases as of yesterday nationwide. The actual number is 2,108. And uh, New York State has 69 of those cases, 639 in the city. Almost all of the other cases diagnosed in the state, 40 of them, are located in the downstate area, but yesterday we had a case diagnosed in Tompkins and in Albany counties. So we expect the number of cases to increase. This reflects both increased diagnostic um, uh, and, and ascertainment, and it reflects ongoing transmission within communities. I'm going to take a moment just to remind everybody about monkeypox as a clinical syndrome. It is rarely fatal. Uh, but it is extremely unpleasant, and the lesions can be severely painful. Uh, so, and also, they're scarring lesions. As they heal, they will leave scars. So this is something that nobody wants to get, but there have been no deaths reported in the United States. The other thing to be aware of is that we have to await the rash to make a definitive diagnosis. So once the rash emerges and that pustule forms, we can do a swab and test it for virus. 
At this time, there is no other way to diagnose monkeypox save swabbing a pustule. But people may feel symptoms and feel unwell before the rash appears, and we want people to be alert to flu-like symptoms, swollen lymph nodes, and of course, if you get a rash, you should seek uh, uh, attention if you're concerned about monkeypox. In this outbreak, rashes have not always been generalized as they are classically. They've occurred on or in the mouth, in the genital area, in the perianal area. Uh, so they have been more localized than we've seen. Uh, that once you have symptoms, these can last for two to four weeks. As, lo as long as you have heal a healing rash, you are contagious. Uh, you have to wait until all of the pustules have scabbed, the scab peeled off uh, with healthy skin beneath before we can be confident this can take two to four weeks. All right, let me just say again that anyone can get monkeypox, but in the current outbreak, uh, monkeypox is primarily spreading through the social networks of gay, bisexual, and men who have sex with men, and it spreads through prolonged skin-to-skin, face-to-face contact, the kind of contact that people have during sex or other intimate activities. It's important for New Yorkers to protect themselves, the people they love, uh, their friends, their community, and it's important to ask sexual partners whether they have a rash or symptoms that are consistent with monkeypox and to avoid skin-to-skin, face-to-face contact if you have a rash or if you are having um, intimate relations with somebody who has a rash. Consider the level of risk in clubs, raves, saunas, parties, other places. Uh, where people are having uh, contact with multiple individuals and uh, consider these to be high-risk situations. Again, consult a healthcare provider and follow provider recommendations for testing. I'll reiterate that the testing does depend on a lesion. All of us wish that there were a rapid test as there is for COVID, uh, but there is no test like that at this time. We uh, have a uh, in this state, two outstanding public health labs. The Wadsworth Center is able to process about 240 specimens a day. We continue to have capacity. We have no backlog of untested specimens. And as I've mentioned, we now have commercial labs bringing on board uh, COVID, I mean, sorry, I misspoke. <laughs> uh, with the same people who are responding to monkeypox are also working hard on COVID, which we'll turn to in a moment. I also just want to say a word about treatment. Um, so um, treatment, uh, there are antivirals available for treatment, but for most people, the treatment will be symptomatic. It's aimed at reducing symptoms, keeping that rash clean, uh, dry, protecting against additional possibly bacterial infections, uh, uh, avoiding sun exposure, uh, taking um, time to go to a healthcare provider to uh, talk about over-the-counter remedies like uh, calamine lotion uh, and other topical aspects that can help with the itch of the rash, and also things like uh, lidocaine jelly that can help with the pain of the rash. Uh, over-the-counter stool softeners may help with the pain uh, in, in a perianal area. Uh, the vaccines is the next thing that I'll turn to now. Uh, because of a limited supply, our eligibility criteria continue to be based on people at highest risk of exposure or people who have been exposed to monkeypox. And that includes individuals who've been exposed in the last 14 days and those at, um, at risk of uh, recent exposure to monkeypox. That includes members of the gay, bisexual, transgender, gender nonconforming communities and other communities of men who have sex with men. Uh, the window for contact is the last 14 days, and uh, people who've had skin-to-skin -skin contact in a network uh, where monkeypox transmission is ongoing uh, are also eligible. We are distributing this supply through local health departments who are using a variety of strategies uh, to ensure the vaccine is made available and that it is made available in an equitable fashion. We do not at this time have vaccine to uh, provide a vaccination to everybody who wants or needs uh, a, a vaccine. 
We continue to advocate for more vaccine from the federal government, and in this uh, we have the active support of our governor. Uh, on, the web, on the slide here, you can see the website where you can get more information about monkeypox, and we have a texting program that people can enroll in, uh, either in an English or in Spanish, uh, and you uh, can see there the, um, the text number is monkeypox to 81336. So with that, let me thank you, and back to you, Governor. Thank you, Dr. Bassett, for the very thorough, as expected, uh, no, but necessary, a necessary conversation about, you know, the reality of what monkeypox is all about, how it's spreading, the numbers are continuing to go up, and we need to be transparent and communicate as openly as possible with the public about how it's transmitted, what the remedies are, and how we're working really hard to be able to secure more doses to protect everyone. Uh, but at this point, I'd like to bring in someone who's been in regular communication with us, and I want to thank Dr. Ashish Shaf, who's the White House coordinator uh, on COVID, but we also have been having many conversations about what you are doing on the monkeypox distribution. We've talked about our numbers and our cases in New York, and I, and I really just want to thank you for your willingness to you know, look at the normal distribution based on population, but also recognizing that we have uh, at least a quarter, if not a third of the cases in the country here in New York State. So uh, Dr. Jha, thank you very much for joining us today. Governor Hochul, thank you. And thank you for your extraordinary leadership and partnership here. And uh, always a pleasure to also follow Dr. Bassett, who's one of our nation's preeminent public health experts. So you've got a great team and, and uh, this has, I think, been a really good partnership on our end and we are just grateful for that. I'm gonna take just two, three minutes. I'm gonna spend a minute talking about COVID because it's still with us. We have a set of challenges that we uh, all have to manage and then I will talk about monkeypox. Uh, both recap some of what we're seeing at the national level as well as what we expect in the days and weeks ahead. In terms of COVID, as uh, many of you might have heard me talk about right now, the, the challenge that's facing us is BA5. Uh, this is a subvariant of Omicron. Uh, it is now the dominant variant in the United States. Uh, about 70, 80% of all cases uh, are BA5. And the reason it has, it has us concerned is because it's incredibly immune evasive. Uh, people who were infected three months ago were seeing high levels of reinfections. People who have not been boosted for a while, have not got the vaccine shot in a while, we're seeing a lot of breakthrough infections. But the key message that I want to make sure everybody understands is that the key tools that we have developed over the last 18 months, vaccines, treatments, our diagnostic tests, they continue to work against BA5. And probably the most important message on COVID that I want to get across today is if you are over 50 years of, of age, and if you've not gotten a COVID shot this year, if you've not gotten a vaccine this year in the year 2022, you need to go out and get one now. Um, it will offer a very high degree of protection, keep you out of the hospital, uh, and will get you through the rest of the summer into fall. And we do expect in the fall, we will have a new generation of vaccines uh, that are Omicron specific. Getting vaccinated right now will not make you ineligible for that. Very, very important. Everyone over 50, if you've not gotten a shot in the last six months, please go out and get one. Um, and as I said, the other part is our treatments are continuing to work. If you're over 50, if you have any risk, high risk conditions, if you have a breakthrough infection, get treated. New York has been one of the national leaders on setting up easy access to treatments through tested to treat sites, a uh, whole set of ways that uh, New York is really leading the country. Uh, but the goal is in partnership, uh, the federal government, your state government working very closely to make treatments uh, as easily available and as widely available as possible. So those are my key messages on, on, on COVID. Let me now turn to monkeypox. Um, and again, Governor, uh, this has been, as these things always are, a very close partnership. And, and I really appreciate uh, your leadership, uh, Mayor Adams, uh, in both advocating for New York, uh, as well as uh, making sure that we're all aligned and focused on trying to get the, the, the limited supply of vaccines we have uh, to the people who need it most. So I want to just talk a little bit about vaccinations and where that is. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, there were about 10,000 doses out into the community. Uh, that number has gone, uh, has grown exponentially. We're over 100,000 doses have been administered. Just last week, as the governor said, uh, we announced another 131,000 doses allocated. Of that, New York as a state got about 33,000 doses, a little more than 25%, and appropriately so. 
Uh, as you heard, the outbreak, uh, it, it's happening in many places across the country, but certainly New York has uh, a, a substantial share of the outbreak, a substantial number of cases, and New York absolutely uh, needs and deserves those uh, doses. And right now, based on all the allocations we have given out, uh, total of about 65,000 doses of vaccines allocated to New York uh, so far. That, by the way, just to give you a perspective, uh, that's enough vaccines for the first shot for about 50% of the population at risk. We're talking about people living with HIV. Uh, we're talking about uh, men who have sex with men who are eligible for PrEP. Um, and, and that's, so that's progress, not enough. We gotta keep going and we gotta keep doing more. So let me just talk to you a little bit about what uh, people should be expecting in the days and weeks ahead. Uh, there are about 800,000, a little less, I think about 780,000 doses uh, that were filled and finished in Denmark. Um, FDA inspectors have uh, went and, and did inspections in Denmark, are back. Uh, those doses are coming over to the United States. We expect about half of those doses to be in the United States this week over the next uh, few days. Another, the rest of it coming next week. Uh, FDA uh, inspectors, FDA scientists are running some integrity checks, making sure the vaccines are uh, in good shape. You know, I know everybody wants to move very quickly on this. FDA really is a gold standard. We want to assure safety of these vaccines. They are moving about as fast as possible to get all of that kind of safety checks done. Uh, and we're expecting early next week uh, to get a thumbs up from the FDA, assuming everything goes well. And I don't want to prejudge that, uh, but assuming everything goes well. That means another 760,000 doses nationally become uh, available. My hope is over the next few days, we'll be able to make allocations. Again, disproportionately giving vaccines to places where the outbreaks are the biggest. Um, but, but in the days and weeks ahead, you're going to just see more and more vaccines become available. And obviously, after that 760,000 doses, we're not going to be done. We're, going to, we're continuing to work with the one company in the world that makes the Genios vaccine uh, to try to get um, more vaccines produced, both there and in the United States, uh, and with the goal of more and more vaccines becoming available. La let me just finish the last point. Vaccines are only one part of the three-part uh, attempt here. we got to also make sure diagnostic tests are becoming easier to use. You heard from Dr. Bassett, We've got great, great, great state labs, arguably among the best state labs in the country are in New York. Um, we're also making commercial labs uh, available, uh, making sure that that's easy to access. And we're doing a lot to make sure that treatments are also becoming easier and easier for doctors to get. So this is a tripartite sort of try, you know, a, a three pronged approach. Um, but one thing that's always been very clear to us is there's only so much we can do here in the federal government. Public health works best in America when it's a tight partnership between states uh, and the federal government, and we could not be happier here in the White House uh, with the partnership we have with Governor Hochul, with Dr. Bassett, uh, Mayor Adams, Dr. Bassan, the, the entire New York team. So thank you for that, and thanks for letting me spend a few minutes with you. Good. Dr. Dodd, thank you so much. We appreciate the attention you've been giving us after we've had many conversations, and I, I know you know our concerns, and that help is on the way, correct? Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Dr. Dodd. Have a great day. Thank you. All right. Now for the topic of the day, COVID. There's so much going on. Uh, we have a lot to cover, but, you know, it's another chance to take a look at what we talked about, the emergence of BA5. And so I wanted to give New Yorkers an update of where we're at. And as much as it's phenomenally hot outside, in fact, before we're done today, I'll give you a, a heat update, weather update. Uh, Fall is rapidly approaching. And as we've seen from past trends, this is now our third season heading into fall after seeing numbers decline late spring and in the summertime, uh, fall's quickly approaching. We're watching the numbers, but people start heading indoors, it gets colder, and kids are heading back to school. So what we've been doing intensely, having many, many meetings internally to prepare for uh, the future, but the future is right around the corner starting this fall. So like I said, we've seen cases before. Look at the numbers of, uh, this is the history. Uh, this is what we're very uh, cognizant of uh, in what happened in 2020. Uh, in 2021 and what could be happening now, the number of cases uh, that start spiking up this time of year. So, so that means it's time to be prepared. Uh, we need to make sure that we look at the cases. Uh, you can see our, our spike that went up because of Omicron in the wintertime. We, we got through that, but uh, if you look at you know, June 20th, July 16th, trending upwards a little bit, uh, we're at 37 uh, cases per 100,000. Last week was 35, a month ago was 24. You know, so 
So not a serious spike, but uh, you know, when you compare to Omicron, you talked about we were at 37. We were at uh, 381 cases per 100,000 at that time. But uh, we've seen the past, and the past can become the present if we don't take the steps necessary now. Uh, again, look at the uh, July 16th numbers, just a little creep up there. New York City being one of the, you know, been the highest right now. Hospitalizations, this is what we watch at the Hawk. Uh, we've had, we lost 22 New Yorkers yesterday, you know, individuals who, you know, succumb to this illness. So it is still real. It is still dangerous. And, you know, we are looking at hospitalizations trending upwards. A month ago it was about nine per 100,000. Today it's 12, almost 13 per 100,000. Omicron uh, was 62 per 100,000. So we're not there, but uh, we need to be cognizant of what could be our future. So these are our hospitalizations, uh, our trends. You see at the bottom, they are absolutely trending upward. So vaccinations are the key. We've talked about this a lot. We still are proud that we have, uh, we're number one in the nation for having the adults fully vaccinated, number one for teenagers fully vaccinated, and number two in the nation for children five to 11 fully vaccinated. But we can do better. Uh, these are numbers I want to put in front of the public once again. Uh, to say, where are you? It's time. They're readily available. No scarcity, no lines, no hassles. Uh, there is no excuse. So uh, Dr. Jha also talked about the importance of boosters, uh, as did Dr. Bassett uh, talking about. We talk about this often. Uh, the booster right now, the second booster is only approved for people who are 50 and over and uh, 12 years old who have an immune, weakened immune system. We are pushing the federal government to expand this. Uh, we think we're going to get some information soon because we believe uh, that this should happen and New York State stands ready to get the additional boosters out the door. And again, there's no shortage. Uh, it's just we're waiting for the law to catch up with what we're dealing with here. So, so those are our number. Over 9 million people have been uh, received boosters, but we have more to do as well. So let's talk about the future. That's where we are today. If anything, this pandemic and COVID has taught us uh, preparations are, are the key to literally survival. And when I came into office last fall, we rolled out a plan to deal with schools and a, uh, a smooth plan to have schools reopen. And then all of a sudden we got slammed with Omicron and we saw a very uh, serious crisis at the time. So I wanted to sit down with my team now and develop uh, two plans. One is in the short term. That is our fall action plan to prepare for fall and winter this year. And for the long term, uh, what we're calling our pandemic after action review. So let me start with the fall planning, which is now underway. Uh, yes, this looks like a military operation. This is what we operate under with our, our very, very regular meetings to talk about all the points that we need to be assessing and uh, examining our response and our preparation. It is militaristic and how we do this, but it, we're serious. We're very serious and intentional about how we're going to deal with this pandemic because it is trending upward and we expect it to continue to increase. So that's sort of our, our map, but let me walk you through some of those elements of it. Unlike a year ago, we have far more tools at our disposal between availability of tests and vaccines and treatments, uh, the boosters. And again, we our goal has been to remove any barriers to people receiving these goals, make sure they know the availability, make sure the doctor's offices know. Uh, and also looking at the overall strategy, we will be talking about our return to school strategy, getting more New Yorkers vaccinated and boosted, testing early, testing often, more access to treatment and therapeutics. Also stockpiling, yes, once again, having the stockpile uh, PPE, strengthening our hospital systems that really were under such stress. And I will talk about what we're doing there as well as coordinating with our partners. Uh, but also something else. I wanted to hear directly from New Yorkers and how they're feeling about um, what's going on and how they're uh, adapting to the new normal. So we listened to them. We conducted a survey uh, just last month and I just want to highlight some of the key findings. And most New Yorkers feel things have gotten better. Uh, they currently feel safe about the state of COVID. About 90% feel somewhere between neutral to very safe. And about 75% still believe in the ability to vaccines to prevent transmission. Uh, that's important to us. Uh, people know about antivirals, but they don't know how to access them. You know, 70% know that the antivirals are available. Um, and also 80 to 90% of New Yorkers have said that they have no trouble accessing at-home uh, tests and PCR tests. But people who are uninsured, we knew this could happen, uh, are having a hard time accessing uh, accessing um, the PCR tests. About 40% think they don't have them available to them. 
So um, we have provided more information about eligibility and effectiveness uh, around people over, four, over 65. Um, they're willing to do so if they're provided more information. So we're focusing on you know, that place where we are, just sort of a snapshot in time of what it's been like after two years. But let's talk about our return to school strategy and how that is critically important because as we start venturing into back to school shopping and getting supplies and thinking about that return, I know it's only midsummer, but we have the luxury now of time to prepare for the inevitability, which is parents and teachers being anxious about going back into the classroom again. So parents, we have a return to school strategy once again, and we're gonna make sure kids are safe and protected. So uh, here's what we're proposing. We are now distributing, at this, as we speak, over three million test kits to school districts to make sure that every student and member of their staff can test before the first day. We encourage everybody to take advantage of this. We did this last year. I was only in office uh, starting August 24th. Uh, start of school was literally the next week, so we had a, uh, an emergency crisis where we were trying very, very hard to protect kids in schools and getting information and, and vaccines and everything out there, but uh, we're in a different place this year. We have the time to say, okay, what has to happen? Direct communication with our school districts is key, telling them these are coming. Uh, we are making sure that we can have the tests available to schools, which is why we've been amassing so many test kits. Right now, everybody's gonna ask about, are kids gonna need tests in, or masks in schools? This was a big issue last year. Um, right now, we're saying they don't, uh, that we don't currently based on today's numbers, anticipate the need for masks in classrooms, but I'm going to reserve the right to uh, return to this policy if the uh, the numbers change, the circumstances change, and the severity of the illnesses change. So uh, God forbid there is a variant that affects kids more severely. You know, we've seen a lot through this crisis. I feel like we've seen everything, but maybe we haven't, and that's what we're preparing for. So my number one job is to protect the health of New Yorkers, especially our vulnerable children, and if we learned anything, uh, we know that kids need to be in school. One of the biggest takeaways that we'll be talking about in our analysis, uh, the effect on children not being in a cool school setting, and we're still dealing with the aftermath today, so it is our objective uh, ensuring the safety of our students, but that they be in classroom for in-person learning this fall once again. Uh, next part of the strategy, more vaccinations and boosters. 99% of residents live within a drivable distance to a vaccine provider. That's extraordinary. Uh, you know, a year ago, we would have just thought that's never going to happen, or even six months ago. I mean, so a lot of work has been behind this. Uh, we have a, a provider network that can, uh, we can take care of boosting all residents over 65 in a short time. We know how to do this. Uh, we know how to do these operations now. And also, uh, you know, we're just assessing our overall infrastructure. Are there shortcomings? Are there parts of the state? Are there buildings and congregate settings and places where people have vulnerabilities. We also know we can stand up mass vac sites like this if we have to. We know what to do, and that gives us some comfort, and we're prepared. You know, if we see the numbers, something changes, and again, we don't always know that we can count on the federal government to, you know, send in the, uh, the cavalry. Uh, we don't know that they'll be there with the money that they had been in the past. Uh, we don't know that they'll be there with the resources, so this is ensuring that we can be independent and take care of our residents. Also, a part of our strategy is to uh, continue with the testing. And what we did, and I'll never forget these dates because it was November 26, because we were doing a lot of holiday briefings around Thanksgiving and Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. I think a lot of you uh, may recall that. Uh, we saw that the spike in Omicron went from being a, just named on November 26, our first case around December 1st or 2nd in New York, and all of a sudden the numbers were off the charts. And that was right when we were talking about kids being home for the holidays, gathering with all their relatives, uh, super spreader events around the holidays, and then kids returning to school shortly thereafter. So what we did in a very intense way, really a, a, a crisis situation, we had to amass as many test kits as we could because if we didn't have them, we were not gonna be able to send kids back to school. So we were so aggressive in this and I'm proud of what we did. We talked about this at all of our briefings, uh, our daily meetings, how we could amass over 100 million test kits so we could open schools and keep our prisons safe, our nursing homes safe, and make sure that there was no shortage of test kits once they became available. And we had more than any state. I think because at one time we probably had more than the federal government because people were calling us 
other states were calling us asking if they could uh, borrow some of ours because we jumped on this immediately to make sure that we could never have to say no to anyone who needed tests done here in the state of New York. So right now we have a, a remaining stockpile of about 20 million and that's dedicated toward our fall effort. Uh, to protect the kids in schools. There's 2.6 million children in schools plus support staff and teachers. So we're going to get the 3 million out right away, but then we'll have enough. Um, but also, so we had that emergency situation. We had to do a lot of ordering, um, short time frame. But now, because we have the benefit of time and analysis and projected trends, we have an RFP out in the field right now uh, to help ensure the continuous supply of tests. So uh, that's being uh, back when? Back soon, Jackie Ray? Yeah, we, the, the plan is to have tests in hand from that by the fall. Okay, okay. So we have enough, but we also have to anticipate a, a challenging fall once again. And the tests have been extraordinary. Uh, the availability of them is just, I guarantee, has stopped the spread when so many people can just test early, myself included, um, make sure that we adapt our behaviors, we stay home if you test positive at home. So, so we also have massive capacity in our labs so that we can do over 500,000 PCR tests every single day if necessary. We're local, working with our local health departments in a way that they know that we count on them as real allies. So, so if we need to reactivate any local test sites, we will be able to pull this off as well. Access to treatment and therapeutics, that's our next step. Uh, we have 44 test to treat sites, but also, as I mentioned, a lot of people know there's therapeutics out there. They don't know how to get them, which is why we put forth this uh, treatment hotline. Literally, you can call this number, uh, speak to a practitioner, and be able to uh, and get the treatment. That was not the case before we put up this phone phone number. So we want people to take advantage of that. And about 40% um, of our pharmacies receive a direct supply of, of therapeutics. For, from the federal government. So, so that's an important part of what we're doing. So let's get people, you know, this hotline we just literally launched uh, about a week ago. Just want to give you some numbers from our one week old hotline to call for treatments. We've had 275 calls. Uh, we had 198 clinical assessments and uh, we had 131 uh, doses of antivirals prescribed. Again, to people who did not act, have access to a, their own practitioner. So if, please call for help if you need anything. We're there to help and make sure that you are not left without the treatments you may need. And also, we cannot forget the effects of long COVID. There are still people hit so early during the pandemic uh, who have that loss of energy and feel that there's, their senses are not what they used to be. And uh, just a lot of, every, it affects everybody so differently. Uh, earlier this year, Department of Health, uh, we talked about engaging a discussion with researchers and clinicians and scientists and how we deal with long COVID and help advance research toward a, a treatment. And just to have people take this seriously and recognize that these are real and it's, it's a huge source of anxiety for people who are dealing with this, but they need to know we hear them, we understand what they're going through and we're gonna be there to help them as we uh, approach the future. I mentioned stockpiling. Didn't think we'd have to do it, but I'm not going to be caught off guard here in the state of New York. We're going to be make sure that we have uh, over 60 days worth. Uh, we have, six, as I mentioned, 20 million at home tests, but also our PPE is going to be there heading into the fall. Strengthening our hospital systems. Uh, this is a topic of another whole uh, conversation. It is a fact that our hospital systems, many places, were overwhelmed. Uh, we had different spikes in different parts of the state, even. You know, as late as this spring, we were setting in the National Guard. Uh, you know, it seems like a long time ago. We just, this winter in the spring, we had National Guard going into hospitals and nursing homes to help with the shortage of workers to help people heal and get better from uh, not just COVID, but from whatever they're in the hospital for. So huge lesson we learned was to make sure that we have enough beds and resources available. And so we're continuing to keep our surge operations center open where we can deploy people to different parts of the state. We don't want to shut this down. We don't want to remove any authority we need to make these decisions. We don't want to uh, take our foot off the pedal because we know from the slide you saw earlier that the trend is that the numbers will go up. So, so that's what this has been all about. And it's just on top of that, we invest in over $20 billion in, uh, to help our health care economy overall raise the workers' pay, get them to stop leaving, uh, improving infrastructure, and incentives for more people to want to join the workforce. And as I mentioned, uh, continuing our surge operations. And we have staffing contracts that we're going to keep in place that we can reactivate people with five days' notice. Uh, that is a uh, tremendous savings of time when you're in an emergency situation you want to be able to take advantage of. So we need that flexibility. We still have that flexibility. We're not 
ceding that flexibility as long as we're still in this environment. And I look forward to the day when we don't need to have those concerns, but uh, also coordinating with our federal partners. Uh, we have a deep relationship with the White House, which is great, Dr. Jha and others who are uh, continue to work closely with us. So those conversations are ongoing. So, so that's our fall plan, a lot of time and energy going into all the different buckets. Uh, so everybody should have their own fall action plan. Uh, stay update on your vaccine and booster doses. Uh, test often. I keep test kits uh, by my bed uh, just in case. When I was off to see my grandbaby, I was going to be tested before I went and saw her. Everything's good. Uh, and just talk to, if you test positive, uh, talk to your health care provider or call our hotline and we'll be able to help you out there as well. So I mentioned uh, that's the current operations. That's very much underway. Let's talk about uh, the aftermath of what we've been going through already. As much as I'd love to stand, I thought we'd be able to launch this when the pandemic is gone. Uh, it is becoming clear to me that we're, it's not gone, so we're not going to wait any longer to uh, start some analysis. And uh, so since March, we've been talking about this in anticipation of a day when we'd be, this would be beyond us. But uh, I want to start moving ahead right now. So we're going to have a pandemic after action review. We're not required to do it. It's not mandated by law, but it is something I feel is important uh, because New Yorkers deserve the best from their government. They need to uh, identify what worked and what did not work and why. And I believe it can not just be a guide for future leaders in the state of New York, but also for other states uh, as we respond to not just COVID, but to future emergencies because we had to deploy. Uh, all the resources of state government. We have been doing so continuously. And how how is that going to function under different circumstances, different emergencies and best practices, and also decisions that you would not want to make again in the future? So no state has done this. We'll be the first in the nation, and we do hope that this can be a blueprint for others to follow. So, so today, I'm pleased to announce that we are posting a request for proposals, RFPs, to continue moving this after action review forward, uh, specifically to review our COVID response, identify strengths, best practices, as well as deficiencies, provide key recommendations, and prepare a planning guide for the state to use in future emergencies. So this is going to be an important resource for us. It's not going to be done overnight. It's going to take a fair amount of time, but we're going to get it right. Uh, we're going to be covering uh, the you know, trans, you know, policies related to medical procedures and hospitals and patient facilities. Uh, the transfer of individuals, uh, vulnerable populations into congregate settings, uh, homeless shelters, group homes, nursing homes, jails, prisons, uh, and how efficient the infection controls were in those settings. That's very important to us, uh, as well as the impact on um, early childhood and school age children and special ed and post education programs and talk about the shutdown and the reopening of schools and how to handle that in the future as well as the shutting down of the economy. Uh, we had a lot of areas affected and so I just I want to make sure that we are very intentional about this that we have a broad scope to what we're doing but also to have a a real blueprint so that is useful to us does not sit on a shelf but can be something that we can uh, employ day after day as we deal with uh, the day-to-day -day crises but also going forward and also look at what you know what what some of the benefits are that uh, based on what we saw people rise up and do you know the whole future of remote work and and areas of you know telehealth services or a lot of good things that uh, came as a result of the pandemic. So we're going to determine also, you know, factors that were used to determine which businesses and industries are considered essential and for what purposes, as well as how we secure essential goods and services to meet New Yorkers. You know, the food supply that was disrupted, uh, uh, the supply of PPE and protection needed for workers. So we're going to also talk about the coordination between the federal government and other localities, you know, counties and cities and making sure that communication is always tight. Communication with the public is important. We're going to be how data was shared and uh, all the staffing and expertise required to implement these emergency uh, procedures. So so this will be a one year contract. Uh, I've asked for uh, initial findings in six months to make sure everything's on track. Uh, and we expect uh, to be able to present a review within a year because this is going to be thorough. This is for the ages. This is something that we, we're going to continue to rely upon uh, again through other crises to make sure that we are operating at the top of our game in a sense, that there are no areas that we would leave untapped or areas that need uh, remedy uh, that are not fixed going forward. So so these are some of the areas we're going to be focused on. And again, it's, it's not going to conflict with other 
ongoing reviews, that's important, but what I want to do uh, is look at, you know, not, not um, you know, interfere with other inquiries that are going on, but look at what I have the authority to do and in my capacity as the state's top executive. Uh, so I authorize a look back for us to examine what happened in the past, but the whole purpose is to look forward an eye toward the future and how we prepare for that and making sure that we are independently running this. So to oversee this process, I'm going to announce that Jackie Bray, our Commissioner, Homeland Security and Emergency Services will be involved. She was a key member of the team uh, starting right around when Omicron started or uh, around that time. So she was brilliant in her execution of what we had to do. Uh, she's responsible for finding the way that we got those 100 million tests when we needed them. I want to thank her for that effort. Uh, but it's also going to be important to me that it, independent entities are selected. The RFP specifically says that any uh, consulting firm that was involved in uh, advising during the pandemic would be not included because we want to make sure that there are, uh, com there's complete independence as well here as well. So, so uh, that's, that's what we're working on. Uh, we're very uh, much looking forward to starting that process. I believe it's an important one. Again, we had thought it would start when the pandemic was completely in the rearview mirror, but uh, that's not going to happen anytime soon. So now is the right time to go forth. Uh, with those preparations. But before we wrap up, uh, can I ignore the fact that we're going through extreme heat, uh, heat wave. And so uh, that's where we're looking at. This is the state of New York as of hours ago. Uh, Jackie Bray, when she's not worrying about COVID response and now managing the, the comprehensive scale of our after action report, she gets these on her desk every about every few minutes or so. They keep updating it. Uh, so we're going to have extreme heat uh, throughout the state possibly going into over 100 degrees. And so just to uh, let you know what we're focused on, we are working with uh, DISHES, Jackie's agency, to monitor weather conditions, coordinating our response. We are also, and this is really important, in constant communication with the utilities. Uh, can they handle the capacity, what this is going to do for uh, you know, the effect on the loads and working sure that they're able to manage the, the need for increased capacity as people continue to keep their air conditioners running and try to escape the heat. Also, we're monitoring air quality. Uh, we're going to continue, uh, if necessary, issuing air quality advisories uh, if we need to. So again, we'll do what we can on the state end, uh, but avoid going out in the peak hours. Stay out of it. Stay hydrated. Keep your pets inside. Check on your neighbors. Uh, and be aware of any other uh, induced illnesses. So just look out for everybody. Uh, but if you, need, if you have uh, anybody who needs help, Make sure you uh, get hold of our Office of Temporary Assistance and also keep track of our local weather forecasts. And so that was a lot today, a lot of lot going on, but it's important, you know, communication with the public uh, through the media. And I appreciate uh, those of you who came through the heat. I guarantee it's going to be a little bit hotter when you leave the room since this went on a long time. But uh, I, I appreciate you being here. It's really important that we have this uh, two-way communication to get out to the residents. But I have the Dream Team here to answer any specific questions on uh, what we're doing on monkeypox, on COVID, dealing with extreme heat, and our act after action review if there's any questions. So uh, happy to open up at this time. Yes. Hi, good morning. Um, so I have two questions on monkeypox. The first is, Dr. Bassett, can you talk a little bit about how uncontained this virus is? Like, is it kind of like measles where if it's 12 consecutive months, it becomes endemic? I just wanted to get a better sense of like how we're handling you know this critical period um, and explaining that to people and then I have a second question um, that's a little bit broader if I can give you time okay. to answer that. Uh, well thanks for that question the first thing just to reiterate reiterate again that it's not uh, it's not aerosolized in the in the way that measles is or COVID is uh, this is spread principally by skin to skin face-to-face uh, -face contact meaning literally face-to-face uh, so uh, in the current outbreak, we understand most of the transmission is occurring through that contact, which is often sex, uh, which involves obviously skin to skin, face to face contact. So uh, we, we have tools that we did not have uh, with COVID. We have a vaccine, we have treatment, uh, we have limitations, and we have diagnostic testing. Uh, you all know that we've had limitations to those, but I still consider this containable. And at least certainly within our country, uh, you know, I've, I've mentioned that there, I don't know, the last number I saw was 68 countries. Uh, that's a, a different challenge. 
Uh, and of course, in West and Central Africa, it's been endemic for decades. Uh, but with, in the United States, I, con I consider it containable. Uh, but we have, we have to act and we have to think about prevention and, as well as vaccination, right. avoiding exposure. Exactly. That was your first question. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my second question is, I spoke with Congressman Richie Torres, you know, and he kind of slammed the government's response to monkeypox, saying that the delay is, you know, and ignoring an existing playbook, a part of systematic discrimination against queer people. Um, I've been hearing this on the ground from just like, you know, local queer New Yorkers who are looking to get a vaccine. I was hoping that the governor or the health commissioner could respond to that sentiment. Would you like me? Okay, thank you, Governor. Both Go ahead. Yeah. Well, let me just say first that I, I do think that there's uh, that there's absolutely historical discrimination that exists around monkeypox, which was ignored as a communicable disease as long as it affected Africans. So uh, it has been endemic in at least eight Central and uh, West African countries, and vaccine has n was never offered to that population. Uh, and we've seen escalating number of cases in those settings in recent years. Uh, part of the reason that we had uh, a limited vaccine supply is for that reason. It was really made available mostly for protecting people from small outbreaks that came here, for example, in 2003 with the prairie dog um, uh, uh, related outbreak. Uh, so, uh, so that uh, I would absolutely agree with uh, Congressman that this is um, that this is discriminatory. Uh, we live in a global world, and there should have been more concern about monkeypox sooner. Uh, with respect to the current outbreak, which, from its beginning in uh, in uh, Western European and other countries, it's now on every continent. Um, the, uh, the, it is affecting largely gay uh, MSM communities, and I think that we're all mobilizing as rapidly as we can uh, to address that. Uh, I, I, uh, I just can't agree uh, with the assessment that this reflects an indifference to the MSM community, uh, but there is not enough vaccine. Uh, we've all heard there's one manufacturer yeah, that was not producing for, uh, for population approaches to controlling monkeypox. They're revving up production, more vaccines on the way. I think you did a good job answering that, Dr. Bassett. So any other questions? Governor, you, you uh, said that at the moment conditions don't necessitate masks in schools as you see it, reserving the possibility that health conditions could change. Um, how do you view right now uh, the, the necessity or lack thereof for masks in MTA assets, and what might change your mind? We are, this is an area I was asked about in the spring, and I said, let's see what happens in the summer, and it's summer and the numbers are going up. Uh, if we had flatlined, we'd be able to make a totally different decision, which I had hoped to be at. We're not flatlining. You know, the numbers went from 24 per 100,000 a month ago, 37. I mean, does it stay there? Does it keep going up? So, you know, we'll continue. Uh, wanting people to wear masks when you're sitting with complete strangers, sometimes in a packed situation, and it's sometimes hot, and uh, there's the opportunity for transmission. I think it does give people that sense of security. You know, we are trying very hard to encourage people to come back to work, use the subways, but they have to feel safe and secure. So we are going to continue monitoring it, but the numbers would have to be lower than they are right now and consistently lower. So we're seeing a trend toward the fall. If if the, the trends defy history, I'd be very happy to know that, and I'd be willing to make the changes at the time. Governor, can I ask you just about published reports talking about this company, Digital Gadgets, which got state contracts. Turns out the owner had contributed to your campaign. I'm wondering if you can comment on that specifically, but also, is there a larger problem here with the extension of the executive order granting emergency powers that some of the regular processes for letting contracts is being bypassed and not properly, not having the proper oversight? I think the situation of, that I just described, what happened with Omicron, we thought the numbers were looking good in November. End of November, Thanksgiving, we're hearing about a new variant, and we are slammed with it by mid-December all the way through January. The numbers were among the highest we've seen ever. If I didn't have the flexibility that the emergency orders gave me, and I had to go out to a lengthy RFP process, which is what we're doing now. Again, we have the difference is we have time now 
We have some stockpiles to rely on. We're going to go through that process because I believe in that process. But there is an emergency. I know New Yorkers expect us to take care of them and their health. And finding the only provider who could get their hands on this, and I'll, and I'll let uh, Catherine or Jackie describe what it was like as people were racing out to JFK, waiting for planes to come in, loaded with the only source that we could find, and we locked up that source. I was not aware that this was a company that had been supportive of me. I don't keep track of that. I truly, here's my team, they have no idea. But the fact that there was someone who could meet that need at that time allowed us to deliver critically important test kits when nobody else, including the federal government, get their hands on. As a result, we got kids back in school in January as opposed to sitting home another semester.